going to start by giving you an overview of what this alternative emerging approach to public management looks like and why we think it's important. So this is the kind of the bit of the big picture story before we delve into what some of the detail of the practice looks like um, uh, as we go through. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to talk to you about this idea of doing public management differently. Uh, I'm going to talk you through the kind of this core idea of the, the uh, complexity and how we can respond differently to complexity than we have done in the past. And I'm going to talk about this idea of human learning systems as an alternative emerging approach to respond to the complexity of the world. So, um, when you join academia, as I did kind of about four or five years ago, I used to be a charity chief executive in Newcastle, so being a, an academic is still a bit of an unsettling recategorisation for me. But when, when you join at academia, they say, um, what discipline, what academic discipline are you part of? I'm like, uh, what's that? So they made me choose. And what I realised that this kind of stuff that we were writing and thinking and doing action research about is this idea of public management. How is the question, answering the question, how is public service planned and implemented? So essentially, we look at and study and do action research around your, the practice that you all do every single day. And when, you, when I got into this as a kind of field of study, I found some surprising language that I didn't know before when I was actually doing this as work, which that the way that we do this stuff at the moment, or have done for the last kind of 30 years, has a name. It's called New Public Management. It was a specific ma management ideology developed in kind of uh, throughout the 1980s and 90s, and summed up in this idea of the three M's, markets, managers, and metrics. Basically, try getting the idea that the way to manage public service is to set particular objectives, so we have strategic conversations about what's desirable for, for the services that we have. We turn those into measurable performance objectives, smart targets, you know. Right? Well, this must be done by that date, but they, by these people, blah, blah, blah. And then we create a whole um, uh, cadre of people called managers whose job it is, is to manage the performance of the teams against those metrics, right? This whole way of working has, is, a, is a particular philosophy called new public management. And I didn't know any of this when I was actually doing it. Oh, so how many of for, for how many of you is the language of new public management familiar? Raise your hand if that's familiar. So about a third. So we've done this in different environments, and sometimes it's as low as kind of a tenth of people who are actually doing this work know the language of new public management. When it's a bit terrifying because what we've seen over the last particularly kind of 15 years is the failure of new public management. And if you look now at the kind of academic discipline and the study of this and the way that kind of different people are starting to talk about it, one of the things that it becomes increasingly clear from the evidence around all this is that new public management does not work in complex environments. Uh, it creates gaming, so it creates a, uh, the, the conditions in which everyone's job is to produce good-looking data rather than actually doing the work at hand. It creates perverse incentives, so people end up doing the wrong thing because they're incentivized to do the wrong thing. And what you find is it makes the actual job of doing public service, serving people in the world, harder, not easier. And it's starting to come out in the different reports that people are writing around this. So this is Sir Peter Houston, who is the ex-head of the civil service in Scotland. He wrote a report, kind of, uh, God, it's four years ago now, that's terrifying, isn't it? Um, where he described the unconscionably long death of new public management. So we have known for a while that this stuff doesn't work in complex environments. But the question has always been, what the hell else can we do? So we know it doesn't work, but if you, the, it, there has been no emerged practice to take its place because people have become so ingrained with the idea that this is what management is that it becomes increasingly difficult to think about what the alternative looks like. So this is the work that uh, we and a bunch of your colleagues have been doing. We've been trying to think, what the hell else can we do? If we know that this stuff fails in complex environments, and we know that the world out there is pretty complex, what is it that we can do differently? 
So we've been working with people like yourselves up and down the country to try and understand what we can do differently. Um, and it's, it begins, we think, by embracing the complexity of the real world. What do I mean by that? Why am I asserting that this idea of complexity is relevant? Um, we think it's relevant because complexity describes the fundamental processes by which the outcomes we care about are made. So we, are, we know that public service is tasked with creating good, positive outcomes in the world, right? We want people to lead thriving lives. We want people to uh, have better health and well-being. In broader things, we, we want people to have jobs. We want them to stay out of the criminal justice system. We want them to be, uh, have effective housing, blah, 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 blah. These are what we are tasked with in public service, right? And so we think if we fail to understand and embrace the complexity of the world, um, we won't be able to create the outcomes that we seek because those outcomes are made by complex systems. And those complex <laughs> systems behave in particular ways that are anathema to the kind of management processes that we've been used to. What do I mean by complexity? Is a representation of the idea uh, of complexity. This is the uh, Foresight Obesity Map. If you're a public health person, you will be very familiar with this. And it's a map of the outcome of obesity. Um, so it's what happens if you shut a bunch of public health people in a room and say, you're not allowed out until you map all the causes of obesity and all the relationships between all of those causes. 108 different factors they created, that they, they mapped, and all, you can see all the kind of little relationships between all of them. Now, you, the, you can't see all the individual factors on this particular representation of it's too small, but you can see them lumped up into areas like food production and supply, macroeconomic drivers, education, media, technology, the nature of work, built environment, early life experiences. What this shows, what this representation shows, is that the outcome of obesity, like any outcome that we care about, is the product of all of those factors interacting together. Right? So the outcomes that we care about are made by whole systems. Right? And there's a particularly kind of telling thing for health and social care people, I think, in this diagram. Because obesity is, a, uh, as, is an outcome that you care about. Right? Whether people are obese or not is an outcome that you care about. Look in the bottom right-hand corner of this system. Four factors out of 108 are healthcare and treatment options. Right? Four factors out of 108. These are the things that you would tend to commission to help create the outcome of obesity. Right? So you might commission uh, weight loss classes, or you might create uh, uh, healthy eating programs, or you might commission gym sessions for people, or blah, 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 blah. But the things that you commission are four factors out of 108 for achieving that outcome. So, what happens if you try and hold people, organisations, who are delivering at this point, accountable for producing this outcome of people being obese or not? You're holding them accountable for things they don't control. If you use any form of outcome-based performance management, payment by, payment by results, or anything like that, you are essentially holding people accountable for things they don't control. And as soon as you hold people accountable for things they don't control, they learn to manage what they can control, which is the production of data. Which is why we have a ton of research reports. I could build a little throne out of them like this, about the problems of outcome-based performance management. And every single time it is implemented, it creates perverse incentives in game. Because it pretends that the world is simple and linear. If you do this, then this happens. Well, the world is not simple and linear. The world is complex, and the outcomes that we care about are the products of whole systems like this. So, if that's the world that we're describing, what are the implications for managing complexity? We care about outcomes in the world. We need to help produce better outcomes. That's our jobs, right? So what are the implications for uh, trying to create better outcomes in the world if those outcomes are the products of complex systems? First of all, it means no more of this. So program logic models, right? You will have made them. 
you'll have asked the people that you, uh, uh, you uh, commissioned to draw them. They are, and this is from the textbook, like for how to, for measuring outcomes and managing for results. A journal called Evaluation and Program Planning 2003. This person literally wrote the book on how to do this stuff. Um, uh, and a program logic model follows a linear set of understanding of how an outcome is made. Mm -hmm. right? You have a set of input resources, people, buildings, skills. They run a, pro a set of processes, workshops, or whatever, that leads to outputs, how many people attended, leads to short-term outcomes, leads to long-term outcomes. This is how cons the, the world of outcomes-based performance management conceptualizes how an outcome is made. Unfortunately, it's totally wrong. It is of no use at all in understanding how an outcome is made. Because an outcome is not made like that, an outcome is made like that. And if you conceptualize that an outcome is made like that, you go wrong from the start. You will not be able to support the creation of outcomes if you think that outcomes are made like that. Because that's not how they work. It has a really, really, really strong implication in performance management in that outcomes are not delivered by organizations. You can see that this is, I think this is an important idea because I wrote it in big, red, shouty capital letters. Right? Outcomes are not delivered by organizations. It's, this idea is so important. It's, if there's one thing you take away from today, I would like it to be this. And it's so important, I want you to get you to repeat it back to me. So after three, one, two, three, outcomes are not delivered by organizations. One, two, three. Outcomes are not delivered by organizations. Brilliant, thank you. The outcomes we desire are emergent properties of complex systems. Right? This is the nature of how outcomes are made in the world. And so if we want to get better outcomes, we need to get to grips with how those as complex systems work. So, how do complex systems work and what does it, what does it mean for us? Firstly, it means that we need the capacity to respond to variety. Because in complex systems, each person's strengths and needs are different. So the people that we are trying to serve each have their own unique strengths and needs. So if you're trying to create well-being in my life, you need to know that, understand how my well-being is different to Mark's or Gary's or yours or yours or yours, right? Because my strengths and my needs are different around that. So uh, complex systems are, have inherent variety to them. Secondly, it requires us to have the ability to adapt to change. Because the context in which we're doing social interventions, and I'm using social interventions here as a catch-all term for everything from kind of healthcare to employment to welfare to all, the context in which we're doing social interventions constantly changes. That means the things that we are doing are interacting with a constantly changing world. So that means the nature of how those things work is constantly changing. Because our intervention is in relationship with a constantly changing world. And whether it works or not is about that relationship with a constantly changing world. So we, the things that we need to do need to be able to adapt to that constantly changing world. And finally, we need the ability to shape systems whose behavior can't be reliably predicted and which no one controls. Again, let's go back to this. Look at all the different elements that go up to making an outcome, uh, the outcome of obesity. Food production and supply, and macroeconomic drivers, and education. How are you as commissioners in Gateshead going to influence those things? How, you, how can you control any of those things? You can't. And yet those all fundamentally contribute to the outcomes that you care about. So how are you going to shape systems whose behavior you can't predict and which no one controls. I'm sorry to say, that's your job. <laughs> I've made your job about <laughs> 10 times more complex in thinking about that, but that's the nature of the world. Right? If we care about pro producing outcomes in the world, that is the reality of the world. We can pretend it's simple and linear, like we've done for most of the last 30 years, but that, it's pretending. So. We begin to try and explore some of this stuff in a couple of different reports that we put together. Uh, this one was from 2017, uh, the known as the Purple Report in the office, where we began to explore what it might look like in terms of funding and commissioning. And then we followed that up by doing a bunch of work alongside the organisations that um, have been working in this way uh, with a report last year um, that 
took those uh, ideas and say, how is that working in different places, not just in terms of funding and commissioning, but also people who are managing the actual delivery of the work itself. And in doing this work, what we're trying to do is just is partly to document what this emerging new practice looks like and tell a story about it. So what does it look like uh, as, a, uh, as a story of management practice? But also to help people do action research around it. Because every single person in the organisation that is doing this is experimenting with working in a new way. There is no model. There is no map to work from. There is no recipe. Every organisation that is doing this is helping to create a map of the terrain. And our role as kind of action researchers is to help people uh, uh, ask the right questions and show them what's happening in their bits of the world and be learning partners alongside the experiments that organisations are doing. So this is why we called this stuff the new world, right? Because you are exploring the new world with every time you try something different. So, as we're working alongside people doing this, and from in the, in the time between the first and the second report, we heard um, people use a particular set of language around this as an emerging new approach, which was, and this new language is around human learning systems. And so, that's why we turned these into pretty little logos and thought, oh, th those are good words to help people understand some of the kind of key concepts of what we're talking about here. <coughs> and essentially, at it's, it's most top level, it comes down to the idea that kind of funding, commissioning, and managing complexity involves a change in service purpose. That the whole purpose of any uh, activity that is any kind of interventional relationship in people's lives is meeting the strengths and needs of those particular human beings. <coughs> Secondly, it says, the, uh, the, the way that management works needs to change in supporting that purpose. That the, fo the, the focus of management roles becomes creating the conditions for learning and adaptation for the people doing the work. And finally, it says that there is a, a shift for leaders as well, a leadership focus. That it is the job of leaders to nurture healthy systems to create positive outcomes. Because if we're saying that it's those systems that create the outcomes, the relationship between all of those factors working together, it becomes the job of leaders to help create systems in which the different actors are able to coordinate and collaborate effectively together. So I'm going to dig into each of those ideas very quickly in turn, and then you'll have the opportunity to kind of ask questions and have some comments about that in a little while. So firstly, this idea of being human. So we could not spend more than 10 minutes with any of the organisations working in this way before someone said something like, well, this is just about being more human to each other, isn't it? We're like, oh, yes, that's brilliant language. Let's write that down. What does that mean? What does it mean to be human to each other in this context? And what, when we dug into that concept a little bit, it seemed to mean variety, empathy, strengths, and trust. So what the organisations who were doing, who were working in this way, were saying, we respond to the variety of human need and experience. Because there are as many ways to be human as there are human beings. And so if we genuinely want to respond to, to another human being, we need to understand the particular unique nature of that person's life and context. We need to understand what their needs are and what their strengths are. Because if we don't understand that, we will not be able to serve them effectively. And if you're going to do that, we need empathy. To, so to understand the detail of the context of another person's life. It's difficult enough in our personal relationships, right? Let alone in our work ones. So how do we build the skill and capacity for empathy so that we can genuinely understand the differences between us as human beings? Not easy. The people doing this work from a strengths-based perspective. So every person that shows up to a particular service or a drop-in or whatever, they show up as a full human being, as a human being with a full life. But we in, have tended to see them as a person with mental health problems or a person with a housing problem or a person with a substance abuse problem because that's the, the way that we are used to seeing people. And it's perfectly natural that that becomes the way that we are used to seeing people. But 
it's mean we don't see them as fully rounded human beings. And finally, and this I think is the, possibly the most significant in terms of ways of working, we found that people working in this way trusted those in the work with decision making. Because um, if you're going to respond to the variety of human need and genuinely understand that my well-being is different from Mark's, from yours, from yours, from yours, how are you as a, uh, uh, a public service institution or a voluntary sector organisation, how are you going to know what people's needs are? Particularly if you're kind of any kind of distance, like you're a commissioner or whatever. The question is, you can't, the answer is you can't. It is impossible for you to know the detail of each person's life and the context. You cannot know that from afar. The only people who know that detail, who know enough about that situation to decide we should do this and not that because this person really likes doing that, they hates doing this. <coughs> The only people with enough understanding to make those good decisions are the people themselves and the people who have a strong relationship with those people, who have spent enough time building a genuine relationship about human beings to know what the other person likes and what their strengths are. And so we need to find a way to trust the people with, who have the knowledge to make good decisions to make good decisions. So. That's what people seem to meant by this is about being more human to one another. So that's the, that's the first one, human. And that gets translated into this idea that public service is bespoke by default. And so the job of social interventions is then to hear and understand what those strengths and needs are through forming relationships with people and respond appropriately to whatever those needs are. Now, in our report, we were going to quote Mark. Um, he described this as the liver the liberating workers from attempts to proceduralize what happens in good human relationships and instead focus on the capabilities and context which enable those relationships. So we have known for a while that good human relationships are essential for effective public service. Right? But uh, the new public management approach to that would then try and criterionize what happens in a good human relationship and enforce that as a set of behaviors <laughs> through performance management on people, right? Say, so, uh, we have noticed, we have done research that notices that uh, people in good human relationships smile when they greet one another and they shake hands. So we will criterionize everyone's job to make sure that they smile and shake hands. We as human beings, we're quite smart. We, I know when it's appropriate to smile when I greet someone and when not, because maybe they come from a funeral, and when it's appropriate to shake hands and when not. And yet, when we get into a work situation, we don't trust the, the really smart, informed people to be able to make good decisions about what a human relationship entails. Human. Learning. So, everyone thinks that learning is important, right? Who, it would be, it would be, it's a pretty tough argument to make, that learning, that's not important. So why is learning different in this uh, alternative approach that's emerging? Well, let's say, let's look at how uh, ex existing public management views the idea of learning. We can see that it's a phase in social innovation. So essentially, we start with a problem in this classic Young Foundation stages of social innovation diagram, a prompt. There is a problem in the world that needs to be solved. Then we do proposals and we make prototypes in response and we try and solve that problem. And then when we fi we'll find what solves that problem, our job is to sustain and scale it. And that makes systemic change. So we learn an experiment, we find what works, and when we do more of that, because it works. The only trouble is, in a complex environment, that's entirely the wrong strategy. Because in a complex environment, learning is necessarily a continuous process. In a complex environment, there is no such thing as what works at a programmatic level, because what works is always changing. Because what works changes in relation to the dynamic nature of the systems that we're talking about. So as the, as the world changes, which it does, right? Who four years ago could have seen where we are now in the UK? Right? The world changes, and significantly. Sometimes lots of little changes, sometimes huge changes. The world changes. And so what works in our environment changes. What's possible 
in our environment changes. So there is no such thing as what works at a programmatic level. So what works is the continuous process of learning and adaptation. Because if you look at what happened here, people learnt, and funnily enough, when they were in the learning phase, they created something effective. But then all of a sudden, what we do in our current system is say, oh, we can stop learning now, and we just, we'll have everyone do that, and it becomes fidelity to the model and performance management, and everyone must do that thing. Actually, what worked was the process of learning and experimentation in the first place. So this is quite difficult from a commissioning perspective, because we are used to the idea that uh, the job of commission is to, is to fund what works. We do research, we find evidence, blah, 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 blah. The trouble is, what we know is that that will necessarily change over time. And so in this new way, uh, under a learning systems way, what funders and commissioners are doing is purchasing the capacity for organisations to learn and adapt. Because it's that learning process that works. And this is kind of one way of kind of framing this that I've come across recently that was quite helpful for me is the idea of the difference between intended learning versus emergent learning. So in intended learning, uh, there is a sense of someone knows what good looks like around here, and the job is to spread that understanding about what good looks like to everyone else. So when I joined uh, Northumbria University about a year ago, I had to do um, uh, online training uh, for uh, fire safety. So, and part of that was uh, a, a kind of little game that I had to play on screen to match a fire extinguisher to a fire. Right? Okay. And it wouldn't let me go through until I'd matched correctly the different types of fire to the different types of fire extinguisher. That is intended learning, and that's a really good thing, because in those environments, there is one type of fire extinguisher that goes with one type of fire. If I try and put a water extinguisher on an electrical fire, no more Toby next time. So there are times when that intended learning is ripe. But in complex spaces, what we're talking about is emergent learning where what good looks like keeps changing, and the process of learning is a process of us all trying to keep up with this constantly evolving sense of what good looks like changing. And so we know that this, from the work of Sahana Chattopadhyay, she um, kind of helped identify some of the practices which enable emergent learning um, and I won't take you through all of those now, but some of the key ones is the idea of um, uh, reflective practice and sense and sense making. So in a complex environment where uh, people's strengths and needs are different and they look different from different perspectives in the system, then what's required in order to enable people to learn are group-based reflective practices where people hear and understand one another's perspectives and make sense of those together. So you don't try and pre-interpret too much material because the process of making meaning together <coughs> is the process of learning. And we know a little bit from the work um, that different people have done about what enables learning in those environments. So we know that learning is enabled by sp funding for learning and not for results. Because if you fund people for results, you're actually, what you're actually doing is funding them to produce the correct data and if you fund people to produce the correct data, funnily enough, they produce the correct data. What they don't do from it is learn. And creating a learning com uh, culture seems to involve, from the people we've worked with so far, removing competition between organisations. Because if you create a competitive environment between people, then knowledge for an organisation is something to be hoarded, because that's the thing that wins them the contract and not the next organisation. Uh, Creating a positive error culture, which is just kind of fancy speak for saying, round here we talk about mistakes and uncertainties. Because if you don't talk about mistakes and uncertainties in a complex environment, you're not talking about your everyday practice. Because in a complex environment, you necessarily make mistakes. Because some of the judgments that you make interact with all that other stuff that's going on that is essentially unknowable for you in a way that produces bad outcomes in the world. This will necessarily happen sometimes. And if you don't have a way to talk about that, how is anyone going to learn? If you have a culture of around here we only talk about success, how does anyone learn? Because that's not the day-to-day -day reality that everyone will be experiencing. And finally, I just want to highlight this idea of using data to learn. Because some people hear this as a presentation and say, excellent, Toby says we don't need to measure anything anymore. No. 
Measuring stuff is really, really important. The question is, what do we do with that data that we collect? At the moment, we're encouraged to parcel up that data to make ourselves look good for accountability purposes. Right? We want to send that data right to someone else to make us look good. If you do that, it, re it makes it really, really difficult to learn effectively from that data because you will have massaged that data in order to make yourself look good. And as soon as you massage that data, it's rubbish, basically. So the organizations that are in this space understand what it is that they need to measure in order to reflect on their practice effectively. So what the teams that you support, what do they need to measure to have effective reflective practice conversations? What is the data that they need to be able to go, did we do a good job there? Are we doing a good job here? And with a little bit of help and support, they will know this. They will know what it is that they need to measure in order to understand whether they're doing a good job or not. Human learning systems. So, going back to our obesity diagram. The outcome of obesity is created by the interaction of all of those factors, right? So, the, from that, we get the idea that um, if it's systems produce outcomes, how do we create healthy systems? Because healthy systems produce better outcomes is the, the, what we've learned, kind of emerging from our uh, research so far. And so the role of leaders as system stewards seems to, is people who look after the health of the system. People who ask the question, how easy is it for actors in this system to coordinate and collaborate together? How easy is it for them to hear one the, what one another's practice is like? How easy is it for them to share information? Do they trust one another enough to be able to tell each other what's really going on? This is the role of kind of leaders as system stewards. And this seems to be the process that these system stewards use to begin to create healthy systems. This is a process of understanding the system, so revealing the system to the actors who are part of it. Ah, have you seen all the people who uh, contribute to achieving the purpose that you've set yourself? And then the processes of co-design and processes of experimenting, and that changes and embeds. Uh, those changes become embedded, and that means that that system has changed, so it needs to be understood again, and this is a continuous cycle. And you will hear a little bit about what this cycle looks like <coughs> in some of the uh, examples from Plymouth. So, in systems terms, this, this question, who looks after the health of the system, becomes really important. Who in your system is asking the question, how easy is it for people to coordinate and collaborate around here? And we named this role system stewardship. We pinched it from an Institute for Government report from 2011. So what is it that system stewards do? Um, what do? Essentially, this comes down to the question, what does a healthy system look like? Right? And we don't know the answer to that question, but there's some people starting to, act to provide answers to that question. Um, so the Langtelly Chase Foundation, for example, uh, worked with a bunch of the organisations that they support and a bunch of others to come up with the kind of nine system behaviours, characteristics that you would expect to find in a system that is working well to serve people who experience a very multiple disadvantage. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but they say things like uh, people in the system view themselves as part of an interconnected whole. In a healthy system, power is shared and equality of voice is actively promoted. So again... If these sound like behaviours that would enable your system to work well, who's asking the question, round here, is power shared and is quality of voice actively promoted? How will we know? How, how, how do you know whether that's the case or not? How, how would you understand the extent to which these behaviours exist or not in the system? That, uh, asking that question, finding the results, working with people to act on what you find, that's the role of a system steward.